Tonight, arrested on arrival. Two Canadian women in custody after years spent in a Syrian detention camp. Picked up by the Mounties in Montreal. Well, the women are being transferred to the court in Toronto. After a controversial journey home. Repatriating um, families with ties to ISIS is just, you know, an unbelievable thing. Ice storm impact, the cautious cleanup in two provinces. It hasn't been fun. Branches falling all over the place. The danger, the destruction, and the race to restore power. Plus, removed from a prestigious academic post. We feel very left out of all of the decisions that have been made. The departure of a university president after a dispute over her claims of Indigenous heritage. CTV National News with Omar Sachadina. Good evening, everyone. Two Canadian women just repatriated from a camp in Syria are discovering the flight home was not a ticket to freedom. Tonight, they are awaiting bail hearings after they were arrested by the Mounties. They are among a group of four women and ten children now back in Canada. CTV's Judy Trin has been tracking their journey and has the mixed reaction to their return. Released from an open-air prison, two women returned to a cold welcome at the Montreal airport, greeted by RCMP, arrested, but not charged. The intention of the public prosecution is to apply for a peace bond. The bond would allow police to monitor the two Toronto-area mothers by limiting who they can contact, imposing curfews and check-ins. They were among a group of four women repatriated with 10 children from a camp in northeastern Syria for people with suspected ISIS ties. And then the news of us reunifying and repatriating um, families with ties to ISIS is just, you know, an unbelievable thing. Jamila Nazo represents 1,200 Yazidi refugees granted safe haven in Canada. Some of them were enslaved by ISIS. Many of them are still healing from the physical wounds that ISIS had inflicted on them, both male and women. But this sudden rush of news comforts Sally Lane. We haven't had a proof of life since September 2021. Her son Jack Letts is in a Kurdish-controlled prison. A federal judge ordered the government to bring Letts and three other men back. But the government is appealing, arguing the region is too dangerous to get to. These photos show Canadian officials signing release documents for women and children. For Lane, it means her son is within reach. Kamishli is the town where Jack's prison is located. It's, ten, it's a 10-minute walk from that handover room. There are still nearly 30 Canadians detained in Syria. Five of them were supposed to be on the repatriation plane that left yesterday. But Omar, two women and three children did not show up for the flight. All right, Judy, thank you. More than 10,000 people from 60 countries remain at camps in northeastern Syria, most of them children under 12. Today, the U.S. State Department praised Canada's repatriation efforts. On the same day, the Biden administration released a review on the U.S.'s withdrawal from Afghanistan. Let's bring in CTV's Washington Bureau Chief Joy Malvin. Joy, there is an admission evacuation should have started sooner. Who and what is the president blaming for the chaotic exit? Omar, the White House says that President Joe Biden had no option, that he was boxed in by the Doha agreement made by former President Donald Trump with the Taliban that all U.S. troops pull out of Afghanistan by May of 2021. The 12 page summary says President Biden's choices for how to execute a withdrawal from Afghanistan were severely constrained by conditions created by his predecessor. The violence, the chaos, those stunning images of people desperately chasing U.S. planes when the government in Kabul fell. Parents pushing babies into the arms of soldiers and a suicide bombing that killed civilians and U.S. soldiers. Here's what White House National Security Spokesperson John Kirby had to say. Clearly we didn't get things right here with Afghanistan. That was never going to be an easy thing to do. And as the president himself has said, it was never going to be low-grade or low-risk or low-cost. 
The White House insists the evacuation was a success. Thousands of Afghanis escaped. But critics say translators and partners are still in hiding, and women have been oppressed by the Taliban. In ending America's longest war, the White House says lessons have been learned, but the full report remains classified. Omar? All right, Joy, thank you for this tonight. We are learning the powerful storm that pounded Ontario and Quebec was fatal. And in Quebec alone, more than 750,000 customers tonight are still in the dark. More than 1,100 workers are racing to restore power ahead of the Easter long weekend. Here's Bureau Chief Genevieve Beauchemin. Trees snap like matchsticks and inflicted widespread damage, painting a gloomy landscape in the aftermath of the ice storm. Branches falling all over the place. We could hear the cracking sounds. Uh, I went and checked my car in the parking lot. There's a big branch that's right on my car. Much of the cleanup effort today focused on the power grid in both Quebec and eastern Ontario. Broken tree limbs sparked thousands of outages. At the peak, nearly half a million Montreal homes and businesses were without power. And most of the city's schools were shut down. It's kind of freaky. And no power, so two kids at home and no food in the fridge now. <laughs> One person would fill it. And then... Without electricity equipment like sump pumps fail. And many owners in Kempville, Ontario, were up all night to save their homes. My teenage son, my husband and myself were just bailing buckets of water to try and avoid the flooding. There was damage, but for some, the consequences of falling branches were far worse. A man in his 60s in Quebec and a man in his 50s in Ontario were killed. A reminder warned Quebec's premier to find safe shelter. Be careful, everybody. Be patient. A message repeated by all levels of government as hundreds of thousands prepared to spend yet another night in the dark and cold. Our focus is very much on, on being there to support as necessary municipalities and, uh, and uh, the province. By midday the wind picked up. It was also a little milder so all this ice that had been stuck to the trees and to the wires started to fall onto the streets creating a very dangerous situation here. And there were those branches that were stuck in wires all over the city. And so crews were scrambling to get to so many areas all at once. The scenes playing out on street after street evoke memories of the devastating ice storm of 1998. But Hydro-Quebec said this time large transmission lines didn't snap and that power should be back up to nearly 80 percent of homes affected by Friday night. 98, I was out of power for 11 days. So if I'm out for two days, well, well c'est la vie. Still with temperatures set to drop overnight, warming centers were opened. A place to plug in and to find some heat and comfort until this frozen mess melts away. Geneviève Beauchemin, CTV News, Montreal. Police in Winnipeg said today there is no evidence to support homicide in the case of a woman whose body was found at a city landfill on Monday. Officers say 33-year-old Linda Beardy was seen climbing into a dumpster that morning. Early afternoon, police say a truck came by and emptied the bin. Her remains were discovered by workers at the landfill a few hours later. No foul play is suspected. A controversy involving claims of Indigenous heritage has led to change at the top of Memorial University in St. John's. CTV's Atlantic Bureau Chief Chris Najgate on the high-profile departure. Ever. Vianne Timmins, the president of Memorial University in Newfoundland, was removed from her role today after weeks of public scrutiny following her claims of Indigenous heritage. In a statement, the university said her contract is being ended on a without-cause basis, closing by thanking her for all of her work. What we do see is a no-cause termination, which makes it very hard for accountability to occur. Outside, Indigenous students shared their anger and frustration. We feel very left out of all of the decisions that have been made and all of the conversations that have been had without our consultation. The fact that we're having these uncomfortable conversations shows resilience with us. Timmins was on a voluntary six-week paid leave of absence after a CBC investigation raised questions on her years of previous claims of being part of an unrecognized Mi'kmaq First Nation throughout her career. In 2019, while president of the University of Regina, she accepted an Inspire Award only available to Indigenous people. Last month, more questions followed after Timmins claimed that her father's great-great-grandmother was Mi'kmaq later issuing an apology for any hurt her story may have caused. 
just because she's gone doesn't mean the harm that has been done or the probable harm that has been done, it's washed away. You're saying, I'm, you know, Bedore First Nation. Well, that's a big red flag because none of us never heard of it. This Mi'kmaq educator says people claiming to be Indigenous for employment and scholarships has been happening for years. Why is it not illegal as a criminal offense to impersonate an Indigenous person because you are committing fraud? Memorial University has now appointed a two-year temporary president. Meanwhile, Timmins is entitled to a severance of 18 months of her salary which works out to $675,000 plus benefits. Omar. All right, Creason, thank you. Canada's labor market continues to defy expectations. The economy added more jobs in March. CTV's senior political correspondent Glenn McGregor on the potential impact on next week's interest rate decision. Traffic was thin at this Ottawa area employment centre. On a day, Statistics Canada reported fewer people are out of work. Canada added 35,000 new jobs across the country in March, and wages rose too, up 5.3% compared to last year. The unemployment rate at 5% remaining the same for the fourth month in a row. An historically low level, not seen since the government began calculating the figure in 1976. The job growth was not universal though, with losses in the construction sector and in natural resources, offset by gains in transportation and warehousing. Still, the numbers are a happy surprise, coming after a string of interest rate hikes by the Bank of Canada intended to cool galloping inflation. For employment, even to hold constant in this kind of environment, you know, a modest increase largely coming from one sector, that's still relatively good news. The unknown, whether the tight jobs market will continue in the face of higher rates, or if a slowing economy will see unemployment eventually rise again. I would say that this is really a second half 2023 story where we do start to see hiring really flatten out and the unemployment rate begin to, to climb towards, uh, we think, around a 6% by the end of this year. The Bank of Canada will factor in these new employment numbers as it prepares for the next interest rate announcement on Wednesday. Most analysts, Omar, expect the bank will hold the rate steady at 4.5%. All right, Glenn, thank you. Jean Chrétien, who once called 24 Sussex Drive Home, says its current state is an embarrassment to the nation. But the former prime minister acknowledged it's a political hot potato. I was there. I did not repair it either. So because I didn't want you guys to sit I was a spender while I was cutting money to balance the books. Chrétien's comments come just days after revelations from the National Capital Commission that the PM's official residence is closed and not considered habitable due to a rodent infestation and fire hazards that will require significant investment. Armed fighters in Lebanon launched the heaviest barrage of rockets into northern Israel in 17 years. It appears to be in retaliation for an Israeli police raid on a mosque at a holy site. Here's CTV's Adrian Gobriel. As rockets pierce the blue sky, air raid sirens scream across northern Israel. This inferno marking the largest attack launched into the country from Lebanon since 2006. Hezbollah and Israel last fought a full-scale war. Israel's military claimed 34 rockets were fired from Lebanese territory with 25 intercepted in the air. One shell shot from the sky, crashing down on this car. I saw the vehicle, this young boy says. He was driving fast. Then the rocket was hit by something and it fell on the car. Several rockets did find their way through Israel's aerial defense system with blasts heard in the region as many Jewish families were gathering for Passover. The further escalation coming after Israeli police violently stormed Jerusalem's Al-Aqsa Mosque on multiple occasions this week during the holy month of Ramadan. The United Kingdom condemning the acts of violence from both sides. We're concerned both about uh, the Israeli security forces, uh, use of force, disproportionate use of force, and not allowing the wounded to receive treatment. At the same time, uh, we're also concerned by the rockets being fired from uh, Gaza and escalating the tensions. No one has claimed responsibility for the rocket attacks, though Israeli officials are blaming Hamas prompting Israel's Prime Minister to call a meeting with his security cabinet. 
כולנו, בלי יוצא מן הכלל, מאוחדים בזה. In a televised address, Benjamin Netanyahu proclaimed, we will strike our enemies, and they will pay the price for any act of aggression. Netanyahu following through on his word tonight, Israel has launched airstrikes in Gaza. As any hopes of a de-escalation quickly vanish. Adrian Gobriel, CTV News, Toronto. Coming up after the break. Because it will signal to the nation that there is no democracy in this state. The vote to expel lawmakers calling for tighter gun control in Tennessee. Plus, having a field day. And, and now it's really going to be the place to be. A major league overhaul at the home of the Blue Jays. Democracy was challenged today inside the Tennessee state legislature. A Republican-controlled House expelled two black Democrats, while a third, who was white, was spared. They led a protest from the House floor calling for stricter gun laws. This was the response after the expulsion as protesters filled the chamber. The extraordinary and rare removal has only been used three times since the Civil War. Here is CTV's Richard Madden. Shock and outrage at the Tennessee legislature. As the Republican majority pushes to expel a trio of Democratic lawmakers demanding tougher state gun laws. We called for you all to ban assault weapons and you respond with an assault on democracy. Calling it extreme partisan retaliation, the so-called Tennessee Three, Justin Jones, Justin Pearson, and Gloria Johnson are accused of bringing disorder and dishonor to the House. How will we address the crisis at hand? Breaking the rules by using a bullhorn inside the chamber and calling for stricter safety measures following that deadly school shooting in Nashville last Monday. Six people died in Nashville. At the Covenant School, three were nine years old. But instead of focusing on that, Representative Jones, Representative Johnson, and myself are being expelled from the state house because we said we cannot do business as usual. The House Speaker comparing their actions to the deadly January 6 insurrection on Capitol Hill. In the end, Republicans voted to expel Jones and Pearson. Johnson was not. It might have to do with the color of our skin. We are losing our democracy. We need to make sure that we stomp out this march to fascism. The vote comes one day after thousands of students nationwide walked out of their classrooms. Protect kids! Not guns! Protesters outside and inside the state house say the oustings are a sad distraction from the urgent issue of gun violence. People shouldn't have to be scared of going to school every day. And tonight, President Joe Biden calling these actions by Tennessee Republicans, quote, shocking, undemocratic, and without precedent, while repeating his calls to ban assault weapons. Richard Madden, CTV News, Washington. The woman at the center of historic criminal charges against Biden's predecessor said today she's willing to testify against Donald Trump if asked. It's daunting, but I look forward to it. You know what I mean? Because I have nothing to hide. I'm the only one that has been telling the truth. And, you know, you can't shame me any even more. So there's no doubt if they... Ask you to testify, you will testify. Oh, absolutely. In an interview with Piers Morgan, Stormy Daniels said she doesn't think the former president should be imprisoned for his alleged crimes, but says the indictment is proof no one is above the law. Still ahead. As I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. What a medical examiner is now saying about the death of rapper Coolio. The Los Angeles medical examiner has revealed Grammy Award winning rapper Coolio died after a fentanyl overdose. Come on, y'all, let's take a ride. Don't you say a word, just get it. The 59-year-old known for songs Fantastic Voyage and Gangsta's Paradise was found dead in his friend's home last September. His death was ruled an accident. Police in Akwesasne First Nations say they've suspended the organized search for a man they suspect is connected to the eight migrants who died in the St. Lawrence River last week. In a statement, police say they've exhausted all efforts looking for Casey Oaks, who went missing the same day the migrants' bodies were found. Investigators found Oaks's boat and clothing in the water, but have run out of leads. Police say they will continue to look for Oaks during normal patrol duties. A somber anniversary in Saskatchewan today to mark five years 
since the tragedy that rocked the entire country. The bells at Humboldt St. Augustine Church tolled 29 times, once for each victim. 16 people were killed and 13 others injured back in 2018 when a transport truck slammed into a bus carrying the Humboldt Broncos hockey team. Today, families and friends paid their respects at the crash site. The feeling never really goes away. It's, it's, it's this time every year, it's, it's always brings back, I mean, sad memories. A tribute was also held this evening at the Broncos home arena. After the break, the facelift for an iconic Canadian ballpark. Well, Canada's only baseball team is betting on a multi-million dollar renovation to reinvigorate the home of the Toronto Blue Jays. Here's CTV's Heather Butts on the change the team hopes will be a home run. A celebratory cut at center field marked a new era for the Rogers Centre. Today is most exciting for thinking about just five days from now what our fans will see when they stream through the gates and, and down the aisles and fill the outfield and fill the new seats in the 500 level. The Blue Jays president calling it a major transformation from a stadium to a ballpark. Ever since the Jays 2022 playoff run ended in heartbreak, renovations have been underway and this is just phase one. First opened in 1989 as the Sky Dome, the revolutionary retractable roof helped make it a destination in Canada. More than 30 years later, it was time for an upgrade for one of the league's oldest stadiums, with a focus not only on the game, but those who watch. We'll try to create experiences for every type of fan, not just one type of fan. We're going to get our fans closer to our players, probably closer to the visiting players than they want, but that's okay. The raised bullpens are sure to draw some attention. In the outfield, some seating has been removed to make room for so-called neighborhoods, with several new patios and bars highlighting new ballpark menus. These used to be the least desirable seats in the ballpark, uh, Park Social and also our Corona rooftop across the way, and, and now it's really going to be the place to be. Other areas are geared towards family and fun. Some seats are gone entirely, while thousands have been replaced. The second phase of renovations will start when this season ends and focus on lower levels and behind-the-scenes facilities. Because we've tried to build these spaces with our fans in mind, we've done a lot of research, and, and we've tried to bring the city into the ballpark. Bringing more to the game for fans and the boys in blue. Heather Bot, CTV News, Toronto. A new experience. And that's a snapshot of this Thursday for all of us at CTV National News. Thank you for watching. John Venavelli Rao will be here tomorrow. Have a good night and a good Easter weekend ahead.